Welcome to worship with Memorial United Methodist Church of Gladstone, Michigan. I'm Kathy Rafferty, the pastor. I am glad that you and I and God are gathered here to worship. Today's the first Sunday in the season of Lent, a time of spiritual preparation leading us toward Holy Week. And as we enter Lent, we're invited to embark once more on a journey of returning to God, of being reconciled to our Creator, to each other, and to all God's creation through Jesus Christ. And this year, we're taking the song, Just a Little Talk with Jesus, as our theme. Over the next five Sundays, we'll listen in on a conversation someone from the Bible has with Jesus, and we'll consider what Jesus may be saying to us as well, or perhaps what we may need to say to Jesus or to someone else in our lives as we move toward the promise of reconciliation and resurrection we have in our Savior, Jesus Christ. The song, Just a Little Talk with Jesus, was written by the Reverend Clevant Derricks. He was born in 1910 in East Chattanooga in Tennessee. He studied at the Cadet Conservatory of Music in Knoxville, in the Tennessee Agricultural and Industrial State College, now Tennessee State University, and the American Baptist Theological Seminary in Nashville. And by age 21, he was serving the Vermont Avenue Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., where he directed a gospel choir of over 100 voices. And throughout his life, he composed some 300 songs, and then Reverend Derricks died in 1977 at the age of 67. So in the 1930s and 40s, he sold his compositions, including Just a Little Talk with Jesus, to the Stamps Baxter Publishing Company in exchange for their songbooks, which he then sold for 10 cents each. 50 songbooks at 10 cents each, he made all of $5, uh, $50, uh, $5 for Just a Little Talk, which was used by a multitude of other artists later as they recorded and profited from it, including the Oak Ridge Boys, who earned a Grammy for it in 1978. The Stamps Baxter Company published songbooks for the widely popular singing conventions that were held throughout the South during that time, and much, most of the white participants using the songbooks probably didn't realize that Reverend Derricks was a black man. If they had, it's unlikely that they would have even sung his songs. Although, as it turned out, the same songs ministered to impoverished blacks in the Jim Crow South, spoke to the hearts of the poor whites struggling through the Depression and World War II years. They became standards among headliner country musicians like Johnny Cash and George Jones and even Elvis. And that's um, mostly information from the BatesMeyer.com company and the history of hymns from Discipleship Ministries of the United Methodist Church. Now today, our praise team is going to sing the chorus a couple of times through of just a little talk with Jesus, and you can listen for it to come back around through this season of Lent with gratitude to the Reverend Clevant Derricks. Before we hear the praise team, will you please join with me in a spirit of prayer? Jesus, we need to talk with you, with one another, and with those we label other and mean lesser than who we think we are. As we worship you, help us set aside what obstructs honest conversation. Help us hear you speak with us. Help us hear you speak for those we are quick to judge, content to ignore, or determined to silence. Move us beyond mumbled praise and proud excuses through this season of Lent, so that we might better witness with our lives to the resurrection love of your life. Amen.
This reading comes from Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. Please stand if you are able for the word of God. Then the Spirit led Jesus up into the wilderness so that the devil might tempt him. After Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was starving. The tempter came to him and said, Since you are God's son, command these stones to become bread. Jesus replied, It's written, People won't live only by bread, but by every word spoken by God. After that, the devil brought him into the holy city and stood him at the highest point of the temple. He said to him, Since you are God's son, throw yourself down, for it is written, I will command my angels concerning you, and they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on a stone. Jesus replied, Again, it's written, Don't test the Lord your God. Then the devil brought him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He said, I'll give you all of these if you bow down and worship me. Jesus responded, Go away, Satan, because it's written, You will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The devil left him and the angels came and took care of him. This is the word of God for the people of God. So Satan and Jesus having a conversation. What a way to start a ministry. Just after he'd been baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, and affirmed by the voice from heaven, that same spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness where Satan is going to have just a little talk with Jesus. As we begin the season of Lent this year, I'm wondering who you're talking to. What voices you're listening to. What temptations call to us. What temptations even whisper wrapped in Bible quotes, like Satan talking to Jesus? And I wonder what conversations we're not having that maybe we ought to. Can I ask you to back that slide up one, please, up there, y'all? Thank you. Now, I want to get at that today by sharing a bit of our Methodist history, by talking a bit about a man named Richard Allen. Richard Allen was born into slavery in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love in 1760, before we were even a nation. And I'm drawing today from the life, experience, and gospel labors of the Right Reverend Richard Allen, which was written by Allen himself and published in 1833, just after his death, and from the website blackpast.org. At the time, by the time Allen was a teenager, the British Methodist movement of John and Charles Wesley 
was gaining ground in the colonies. Allen gave his life to Christ at age 17, converted by an itinerant Methodist preacher. He then began preaching on the plantation where he was enslaved and at nearby Methodist gatherings. Working extra jobs over five years and persistently striving to convince the man who enslaved him of the evil of slavery, the enterprising Allen eventually bought himself out of slavery for $2,000 which was a heap of a pile of money in the 1700s. With his freedom, Allen traveled the Methodist preaching circuits in Delaware and the surrounding states. In his autobiography, he writes this about the Methodist church as it's just forming in America. December 1784, General Conference sat in Baltimore, the first General Conference ever held in America. That's that general conference that we still have every four years unless there's a pandemic. This was the beginning of the Episcopal Church amongst the Methodists. Many of the ministers were set apart in holy orders at this conference. And I love this where Alan writes, they were said to be entitled to the gown, the preaching robes. And I have thought religion has been declining in the church ever since. Now, at the time, African Americans made up about 10% of Methodists. The American Revolution had just ended, and the new nation was also getting itself organized. You remember, it took a while between the end of the American Revolution and the beginning of what we know as the United States with our Constitution. So, Allen, in this environment took seriously the ideals that all men were created equal, and it was just men then, and entitled by their creator to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In 1786, Allen began attending St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia, and through his teaching and preaching and leadership, attracting other African Americans with his spiritual depth and command. It was here Alan was tried and tempted. As we listen again to Alan's own account, perhaps we should ask ourselves what we may have done had we been among the St. George congregation. Alan writes this. A number of us usually attended St. George Church in 4th Street, and when the colored people began to get numerous in attending the church, they, the white people, moved us from the seats we usually sat on and placed us around the wall. And on Sabbath morning, we went to church and the sexton stood at the door and told us to go up in the gallery. He told us to go and we would see where to sit. We expected to take the seats over the ones we formerly occupied below, not knowing any better. We took those seats. Meeting had begun and they were nearly done singing, and just as we got to our seats, the elder said, let us pray. We'd not been long upon our knees before I heard considerable scuffling and low talk. I raised my head and saw one of the trustees, and he gives just initials, H.M., having told the Reverend Absalom Jones, pulling him up off his knees and saying, you must get up. You must not kneel here. Well, Mr. Jones replied, wait until the prayer is over. Mr. H.M. said, no, you must get up now or I will call for aid and I will force you away. Mr. Jones said, wait until the prayer is over and I'll get up and trouble you no more. With that, he beckoned to one of the other trustees. Mr. L.S. came to his assistance. He came and went to William White to pull him up and by this time, prayer was over. We all went out of the church in a body and they were no more plagued with us in the church. This raised a great excitement and inquiry among the citizens in so much that I believe they were ashamed of their conduct. But my dear Lord was with us, and we were filled with fresh vigor to get a house erected to worship God in. Seeing our forlorn and distressed situation, many of the hearts of our citizens were moved to urge us forward, notwithstanding we had subscribed largely toward finishing St. George's Church in building the gallery and laying new floors 
And just as the house was made comfortable, we were turned out from enjoying the comforts of worshiping therein. So in other words, these folks had been contributing to build the balcony where they were supposed to be segregated, and when they went up there to sit in it, they were kicked out because they didn't sit in quite the right seat. So they went on to build their own church. In my ears, these words of Reverend Richard Allen from more than two centuries ago ring searingly familiar. I want to think, well, of course I wouldn't let that happen in my church. And certainly I wouldn't let it happen today. But there's a bit of wobble in my certainty. And I wonder if it wouldn't do me well to continue to listen to the words of men and women like Richard Allen. To ponder who may be speaking similar words today and to wonder how well I'm listening. Perhaps to have a little talk with Jesus about my power and privilege, my complacency, inattention, and silence in confronting injustice. Now, Alan and the other African-American worshipers did manage to build their own church building, although the Methodist elder appointed to St. George's continued to harass them mostly over concerns of money and control and the idea that this African-American congregation wouldn't be answerable to some white authority. For years, Allen tried to remain connected to the Methodist Episcopal Church, crediting it with bringing him to salvation in Jesus Christ. But by 1816, after two decades of ongoing conflict with the white-dominated Methodist Episcopal Church, Allen's congregation joined with other African-American churches to form a new, totally independent of white oversight denomination, the first in the nation, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Allen was elected bishop, the first African-American bishop in the United States. Now, not long after Allen had left St. George's, an outbreak of yellow fever swept through Philadelphia, taking nearly 5,000 lives. That would have been 10% of the population at the time. For these details, I'm drawing from an account of the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, which reports this. During the frenzy and fear of the epidemic, Dr. Benjamin Rush, signer of the Declaration of Independence and leading medical mind of the day, he would have been there, Dr. Fauci, I suppose, wrote to Richard Allen and Absalom Jones and implored them to step in and help the sick. Rush believed that African Americans were not as susceptible to the yellow fever. Allen and Jones and many other African Americans agreed to help the sick working as everything from nurses to grave diggers. However, Benjamin Rush's theory was wrong, and in the end, blacks died from yellow fever in similar percentages to whites. By late November, when the cold set in, the epidemic abated in the city. Rather than being regarded as heroes, Allen, Jones, and the black community were vilified. Matthew Carey's pamphlet, a short account of the malignant fever portrayed the African-American community as money-hungry opportunists. So back in the 1700s, 1800s, putting out a pamphlet, that was their social media. That was like firing off a tweet or posting on Facebook. You wrote a pamphlet, and most of the pamphlets had titles that were three times longer than a tweet could even be, let alone the content of the pamphlet. So this is what Matthew Carey wrote. No, it's not. I don't have what he wrote. He just wrote bad things um, and accused the black community of profiting off of the plague. So Richard Allen and Absalom Jones published a pamphlet in answer to Matthew Carey's accusations. And here's just the title. Of the proceedings of the colored people during the awful calamity in Philadelphia in the year 1793 and a refutation of some censures thrown upon them in some publications. 
This is what they wrote. We feel ourselves sensibly aggrieved by the sincerest epithets of many who did not render the least assistance in the time of necessity, yet are liberal of their censor for us, censure for us, for the prices paid for our services. At first we made no charge, but left it to those we served in removing their dead to give what they thought fit. After paying the people we had to assist us, our compensation was less than many will believe. We do assure the public that all the money we received for burying and for coffins, which we ourselves purchased and procured, has not defrayed the expenses of wages we had to pay those whom we employed to assist us. And then they go on in this pamphlet to list item by item what their expenses were to account for the money that they had been given. And they also point out, cracks me up, they point out that Matthew Carey, who had published the pamphlet accusing them, had left town during the outbreak. Allen and Jones' account was endorsed by the mayor of Philadelphia at the time. So again, this experience from more than two centuries ago rings familiar. As I think about who our least paid, most essential workers often are in today's pandemic times and who their loudest critics are, speaking from the safety of comfortable quarantine and access to comprehensive health care. And I wonder, listening to the words of Richard Allen from my own relatively safe haven, who may be speaking similar words today? And how well am I listening? And what may Jesus be saying to me about seeking God's justice. So also to his credit, in 1801, Richard Allen compiled and published the first hymnal by an African-American, specifically for an African-American congregation. And we're going to sing the lyrics of a hymn from that collection, What Poor Despised Company. We're going to sing it to the tune of Amazing Grace. And as we sing, listen to what Jesus may say to us today through these words of his faithful disciple, the right Reverend Richard Allen. And may we continue in this season of Lent to talk with Jesus, to listen more attentively to those we may have ignored, to quiet those voices that tempt us to be complacent, to look away, to remain silent in the face of injustice and in, in evil in all of its forms. Thanks be to God.
our regular offering is one way in which we respond to God's word in worship. And I'm grateful to all of you who, through your regular financial giving, commit yourselves to follow in the way of Jesus Christ and to make ministry happen here at Memorial United Methodist Church. We do have some special opportunities this week for you to financially support those in need as you respond to God's word. We're resuming our practice of receiving a noisy offering on the third Sunday. Something's, all right, there we go. Um, for Hef Heifer Project International, and today is a third Sunday, so you'll see the cow cans back there if you want to drop your change into that. Um, we're also raising funds for the annual Walk for Warmth Project. You remember in past years we had Eat for Heat sometime in January usually, and then um, Community Action Agency sponsored Walk for Warmth, and um, the money they raised would go to help people in Delta County uh, keep their heat on through the winter months. And you can find more details about how we're doing that this year um, on our website or ask me or somebody on the mission committee or check with Lisa. And those of you who um, we have mailing information for, you will have received our Lenten Easter offering letter and calendar by now. And the church councils decided that all of the special offerings from Ash Wednesday through Easter um, for all of the special worship services we have, are going to be split 50-50 between the United Methodist Committee on Relief and Memorial United Methodist Church's General Fund. And you can find a copy of the Lenten devotional calendar on our website, or I think there's a couple extras at the back there. So with all of these opportunities available to us, may God bless all the ways in which we give generously of ourselves in service to Jesus Christ in this week to come. Another way we respond to God's word is by sharing our prayers in worship and giving thanks for God's grace in our lives. I think I just hear a little bit of that going on right over there. Seeking God's help and healing for those tender, hurting, and broken places and crying out for God's justice and well-being for all of creation. Our prayer list is posted on our website. I trust you'll hold those on our list in your prayers. And I would encourage you to contact the office with your prayer requests in the week ahead. I want to just mention we did receive one additional prayer request. Um, Jim Boydston down in Florida, apparently took a fall and uh, is at the hospital. And so we do want to continue to hold Jim and all of his family in our prayers, as well as the rest of the folks um, on our list. So let's take a quiet moment to offer those prayers that are on our hearts, knowing that we pray together as the gathered body of Christ. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this opportunity to gather together to worship you. We give you thanks for our heritage, for those who have come before, listening to your voice, seeking your grace, your compassion, and your justice. Lord, we ask in these days that you would keep us attentive to your voice rather than the voices of convenience or temptation that whisper in our minds. We pray, Lord, for all of those who are oppressed, those who are hurting and struggling, in our community and around the world. And we pray, Lord, for our leaders, that your wisdom and your word would guide them. We pray through this season of Lent that we would draw near to you We pray all of these things, seeking to be your disciples, and so now we pray together as the gathered body of Christ, the words of our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, thank you for worshiping with us today, and I hope that you'll join us next time. Um, we have our online worship available at 8.30, or we're going to continue to do in-person worship until some, something changes. Um, otherwise, we're planning on going forward with that. Um, as we continue our Lenten journey toward Easter with just a little talk with Jesus. Next week, we're going to hear a little bit about what Nicodemus and Jesus had to say. Until then, go in grace and peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>